Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. The text for today is our text from Matthew, or from Mark chapter 4, particularly these words. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. You may be seated. So we are continuing our uh, sermon series that we've been doing here for the Sundays in Lent that is called, What Did Jesus Do? And the, the purpose of it is to kind of think and reflect upon uh, all that Jesus has done as we head into um, Holy Week, Good Friday, and Easter. We'll reflect upon his death and resurrection, but uh, sometimes we might overlook or, um, or not recognize the significance of what it was that he did during his earthly ministry, right? He wasn't just like spending three years twiddling his thumbs, waiting until uh, he got to be tortured and, and put to death. Uh, his ministry was about some, some really important things. And so we've kind of looked at a different one each week. And, and really, if you stop and think about it, each of the, the lessons that we'll look at during uh, these Sundays of Lent are looking at how Jesus, as he brings and ushers in God's kingdom, as he brings in this, this new way that God would do through his son, he's reversing the effects of, of sin in this world. Each one of them is a demonstration that, that Jesus has the power over, over sin and its effects in this world. And today we're going to look at, at Jesus as he faces nature. And uh, Mark pointed out it's one of his favorite stories. It's, it's one of mine as well. You may know it. Uh, but I want to just give you a little background. In Mark chapter 4, we have this entire section where Jesus is actually teaching at the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and we're told this in the, in the beginning of chapter 4. And he, being Jesus, began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him, so they got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on land. So, so, so many people had, had crowded in that Jesus um, had to get, kind of get in a boat and, and, and back away so that he could, he could speak to all of them. And um, here's our map reminding us we're up on the Sea of Galilee. We don't know exactly which side he was on. He was in Capernaum in chapter 3, so... Uh, so maybe somewhere around there. But he's on, the, he's on the Sea of Galilee. And then in Mark chapter 4, we get uh, a number of different things that happen. And so uh, we get uh, the parable of the sower, which you remember is the, that's the one where he throws his seed on the, and it lands on these various uh, types of soil. Uh, then he explains the purpose of his parables just to his disciples. Uh, then we get the parable of the lamp under a basket, a parable of the seed growing, and the parable of the mustard seed. And so those are all sort of the background of what Jesus had been teaching about that leads us into the end of chapter 4 um, that starts this way. Uh, on that day when evening had come, and so Jesus had been teaching all day on the Sea of Galilee uh, in this boat. He had been talking to them, speaking to them in these parables, and he'd been doing it all day. And so finally when evening had come, he said, let's go across to the other side. Now, I don't know how many of you are, are um, uh, boaters or fishermen. Um, but nighttime is not usually the best time to cross a lake. Uh, I don't know if you know this. Uh, but Jesus, for whatever reason, decided it's, it's time to do it. And so he says, let's go the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. So in other words, he was already in the boat. The other disciples apparently joined in. Whether they're all in one boat or not, we're not sure. Because as uh, Pastor Mark pointed out, there were other boats uh, with him. But we think probably the disciples were in, in one with him. So they've all gotten into a boat and they start crossing uh, to the other side. Uh, and then we're told this, a great wind storm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat uh, was already filling. Now, uh, I don't know if you've uh, ever experienced this. Many of you have been on um, a boat, like a small, uh, a small one, but I had experience a couple years ago that, uh, I'm, I'm actually not joking, uh, the scariest, scaredest I had been in a really, uh, really long time. Uh, so I was in Nebraska, that was my first mistake. <clears throat> Uh, I was fishing with some of the gentlemen here from church. Uh, we had a couple boats out there, and we were, we're fishing on a lake in, uh, in Nebraska, and uh, all of a sudden this microburst comes up over the lake, and the waves are just, they're just crazy. In fact, uh, we were trying to cross them and figured out that we had to kind of just stay, stay along the shore, so we head over towards uh, one of the boat ramps. There's a little cove there and a boat ramp, and, and we try to, try to dock the boat, and we realize um, the, the waves are, the wind and the waves are coming at us, and we're not, not going to be able to do it. So... Uh, one of the other uh, gentlemen got off to the one boat and got in with, with the boat I was on, and we had to cross over to the other dock, right? And it was, well, I took a picture of it. <laughs> um, that's, that's what it was, well, my, that's what it felt like, right? I mean, it was 
absolutely terrifying. The water's coming in. You can hardly even see. It was splashing on us. Uh, the boat is just in and out of the waves. And in fact, we finally get to the other boat dock, and, and we can't dock on that one either because it's pushing us into the dock, right? So we come up with this idea, which is the um, pilot of our boat is going to go as fast as he can towards the beach, and then he's going to stop really fast, and the two of us are going to sit on the front, and we're going <laughs> to jump off the boat, which is what we did. Um, and we survived, obviously. Uh, so then we went to get where the vehicles where they were parked, and it's parked in this huge like uh, gravel dirt parking lot. And then the microbus comes up, so we're already sopping wet, and then dust, right? The dust storm blows, and we got like sand and grit in our eyes. So we get in the trucks. We're driving across the dam, and then the the gentleman who had uh, the boat has to go back across by himself now, right? And he was telling me he was he was praying pretty heavily as he got over. So we get back to the, the one we left behind who's sitting in a cove in the calm, fishing. <laughs> and we get out of the trucks, we're like covered in dud and dust and mud, and, and, and the other man gets his boat over there, he's ready to like just pass out from the, the stress. And I don't want to mention any names, but our favorite insurance and salesman is just sitting there, <laughs> fishing in the cove, we're like, what are you doing? <laughs> and he says, I caught a bass. So that's... <laughs> Uh, but, but, but in all honesty, I mean, it, it is scary. Have you ever been in that situation, right, where the, the water's coming in, the boat is you know, just going really in and out of the waves, right? And so we get this interesting story that, but Jesus was in the stern asleep. Um, most t- translate that as cushion. It was actually probably the, the anchor and the rope that was tied up in front that was kind of maybe at the front of the boat, but Jesus is sleeping there. And so I don't know how he's sleeping through that because in my experience that would be impossible, but when you're Jesus, I guess you can so he's sleeping through this terrible storm, and the disciples come and they say, teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? And I actually love this in the Greek. They literally say, don't you care that we're dying to death? Don't you care that we're dying to death? So they're in fear. They're, they feel like they're dying, and the result is going to be death. Jesus, don't you care that we're dying to death? Uh, and he awoke, and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea. I like that. He rebuked it, right? As if... Why did you wake me up from my nap? Right? He rebukes the wind and the waves, and he says, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And I don't know about you, but I find that to just be kind of astounding. As we have already seen in some of the miracles, and as we'll continue to see in the miracles on Sunday, Jesus demonstrates this tremendous power over the course of this world, but also even over creation itself. So that that at a moment when the disciples literally thought it was the end of their life, he's able to stop it in a moment. And and I don't know about you, but that that seems kind of important to us, right? As as we face the storms of our life, as we feel like we're in a moment that there's there's no out of, right? Where we we don't see an end to the tunnel, where we we think uh, it's all over, maybe it's a... It's bad news from a doctor, maybe it's news about employment, maybe it's a relationship that's breaking up. We just, we see this future and we can't see a way out of it. And and to know that God has power over it through his son Jesus to say to us and to the situation, peace, be still. And of course, Jesus is is confused about the the, the disciples and, and he says to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Right? I mean, if you stop and think about it, the disciples had an opportunity to go on the second greatest water ride of history. You know what the first would have been? Noah's Ark is probably the first, but the se- probably the second greatest water ride in the history, because nothing was going to happen to that boat while Jesus was on it, right? He says, have you still no faith? Do you still not understand what is going on? And the, the disciples' reaction to me is, is kind of astounding. And they were filled with great fear. Now, this is a complicated word in the Bible, and it certainly does mean kind of fear as if to be afraid, but it encompasses sort of this awe, right? This kind of thing where, you, where you're standing and you're looking at something and you realize um, just, you get this profound feeling, right? You, you Maybe you feel it when you stand at the Grand Canyon or something and you just have this kind of like You're just awestruck, right? You realize that you're just this tiny person on this huge, amazing world that God has created, right? They were afraid, and they said to one another, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? And there's actually, if you stop and think about it, an answer to that question. 
I mean, they were good Jewish boys. They went to uh, synagogue school. They, they went had through their uh, bar mitzvah. They know the answer to this question. To whom does the wind and the waves obey and submit? God. Right? And, and so now their world is, is kind of challenged, right? And uh, as I think about its application and its encouragement for us, I think of... Um, uh, something I know I've shared with you before. I've told you, uh, but we'll just see how, how much you guys pay attention. In the early church, what was the first symbol for the church? First Christian symbol for the church. You're saying fish, and that is the first symbol for a Christian. What's the first symbol for the church? A boat. It's one of the earliest inscriptions we know uh, in a Christian uh, tomb uh, that shows that they are talking about the church as a boat. <coughs> Uh, here's another one. I think I've shown you this one before. This is, I, had, I discovered this one anew. This is kind of cool. This is from a sarcophagus going to 356 something AD, right? And it hasn't been a boat. And look, it has the disciples there are, are there in it as well. And, and you can find this in um, uh, lots of different places, church architecture, uh, in stained glass windows, right? And, and, and what the early church did is when they looked at this story of, of Jesus and they looked at the, him calming the storm, they recognized that they were in a boat with him, right? That if you want to stop and think about it, our life is like being in a boat with Jesus as we navigate this world. And, and the, church, the truth is that the church has always been in a storm. The church always exists in a storm. In fact, if you stop and think about it, the church was born in a storm, right? It was actually born in a time when there was this guy named Herod, who was this horrible person who, who went so far as to protect his kingdom by killing hundreds of innocent children, right? From its infancy, the church was, was in danger and in a storm because of, of its context. In the early church, the church faced a storm in the form of the Judaizers, the people who said, well, are we going to keep this just a local Jewish thing where people have to be circumcised, keep the Ten Commandments, or, or are we going to share it with the world? And the church had to weather that storm. And the church had to weather the, the fall of Rome, right? Finally, uh, Christianity is the, is the religion of Rome, and then all of a sudden, next you know, Rome is in crisis, and the Gauls are at the gates, and, and Christians are, are, are scrambling and trying to answer the question of, are, are we going to survive? In fact, there was this guy you might know by the name of Augustine. He wrote a manual on how to survive the storm. Do you know what it was called? It's called the City of God. And what he said was that, that, that we are in the midst of a storm, but God always sees his church through a storm. And years later, there would come a time when, when the church was in conflict, when the idea and concept existed that, that in order to be right with God, you had to, to do something, you had to make acts of contrition, maybe even buy indulgences. You had to do something to get God on your side. And the church weathered the storm by having uh, br brothers and sisters who stood up and said, no, that's not how it works. God in his grace and mercy interacts with us. Raise your hand if you feel like at this point in time in history and in America, the church is in a storm. And I don't know how you felt about it. I don't know if that causes you angst or regret or anger or anything else, but I guess I have one question, and I include myself in this. One question. Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? I mean, there, there's no denying we don't live in the same world that uh, we used to, uh, whether you grew up uh, uh, many decades ago or even just uh, were born right before uh, the pandemic. Our world is, is so different. We, we are facing challenges that no one could have, have imagined. Well, not no one, because there's someone who has. There is someone who has seen it. What, what is true about us as individuals that God has seen, how he will see us through storms, is true of, of his church as well. And it leads me to kind of think about what, what Paul was saying in, in 2 Corinthians. I kind of want to walk you through this. Um, Paul doesn't actually use the language of, of a church in a storm, but I think you'd see in it, in, in its context, that Paul is talking about what it's like. What it's like to live in, in a time of storm but believe that God is, is with us. He says, but as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance. And so how many of you would like to be uh, you know, commended by God as a servant 
and, and, to, and to have great endurance. Does that sound good? Well, this is how you get it. Afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, and imprisonments. Now raise your hand again if you want to have great endurance. Right? It's sort of like, uh, I always joke with people, be very, very careful if you pray for patience. If you ask God to make you a more patient person, he's going to give you lots of times and occasions to be patient. And if you want to endure the storms of life, God is going to give to us afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments. Oh, did I mention on top of that there's riots, labors, sleepless nights, and hunger? See, Paul would say that uh, when you're in the storm of the church, when you're in the boat with Jesus, you're not immune to these things. We shouldn't expect to be immune from them. The leader of our faith himself was tortured and put to death. But Paul would come along and say, but we as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by purity, by knowledge, by patience, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, and genuine love. See, what, what I believe God is calling us to in this moment in the church is these things. And, and the problem that I see, and I, and I do it too, I'm not, I'm not pointing the finger, I do it too, but, but too often Christians don't rely on these things in the face of fear. They rely on responding to anger with anger, to fear with fear, to threats with threats. But, but Paul, Paul would come along and say, all the things that I face, all those hardships, riots, hunger, everything, we respond by purity, by knowledge, by patience, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit. And what I love is, see, I, I think if I was writing, I'd end with the Holy Spirit. But what Paul says is, all these things, by the power of the Holy Spirit, leads us to, not love, genuine. And so Paul would come along and he would say, we commend ourselves in every way by truthful speech, by the power of God, and weapons of righteousness. Not weapons of violence, weapons of righteousness. And so what does it mean to live in a boat with Jesus and to go through the storm? It means this. We are treated as imposters. Do you ever hear the world say Christians are hypocrites? Imposters? Paul will say, we will be treated as imposters and yet are true. Notice the, the, the tense of that. Not yet will be true. Treated as imposters and yet are true. We are treated as unknown as people that, that, that aren't understood, the, whose ways are bizarre and pa perhaps antiquated. We're treated as unknown, and yet we are well-known. In 1 Corinthians, Paul would actually say that we are, we are fully known. We are treated as dying. Think about that. We are treated as if we are dying, as if our bodies are headed to the end, we're, as if we are in decay. We're treated as if we are dying. In fact, what it means is we're treated as if our life is of no importance. And Paul will come along and say, behold, we live. And Paul will say, we are treated as punished. Right? Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever have something happen in your life and, and it slips through your mind and you briefly think God is punishing me for something? We're treated as punished. We, we view the world perhaps as that way. And he says, you may be punished, but you're not yet killed. Just between you and me, this is my least favorite of the ones, right? You're punished, but you're not dead yet. Oh, thanks. We are punished and not yet killed as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. I want you to note what he says there. We're treated as sorrowful, and he doesn't say yet always being happy. He says always rejoicing. Our, our joy comes from an inner place, from a, from a God who comes into our life, into our storms, and speaks a word and says, peace, be still. We are treated as poor, and yet, I love this, making ourselves rich, making 
many rich. We are treated as having nothing, yet possessing everything. The disciples didn't see it in that moment, but they saw it later on. As you follow them through the, the, the book of Acts and all the things they face, as they sit in that boat with Jesus, as the, as the storms of life batter the church, the early church, they, they see it now. They recognize that, that they have nothing and yet they possess everything. It's what could lead each and every one of them to, to face martyrdom, to face trials and persecutions and, and beatings. It's because they recognized and saw that these things are, are temporary. This storm is a temporary storm. That, that in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have and possess everything. And so as you, um, as you wrestle with the storms of life, as you, as you think about the boat that you are in, the boat that you're in as you, as you go through personal struggles, as you battle depression and anxiety, when you battle uh, addictions, when you battle trying to answer questions that don't seem to have an answer, God would speak into your life and he would say, peace. Be still. We may be treated as having nothing. But in Jesus Christ, we possess everything. His peace, his joy, his forgiveness, and our hope.